name's uh, Declan Chalvey, and I'm the artist on uh, this new series called Injection with um, oh, thank you. You, you could have applauded after my name, but it's okay, I'll accept after the book. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, um, uh, Warren Ellis, myself, uh, and uh, Jordi Belair, we worked in a series called Moon Knight for Marvel Comics um, last year. And it went really, really well. Um, critically and commercially did really well, and we, it was very artistically satisfying. I was really, really enjoyed it. And um, uh, as we were working on it, uh, I was just talking back and forth with Warren. At one stage, I was saying, oh, like, because uh, he mentioned he was doing six issues. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just do, are you definitely just going to do six issues, or I might do something career owned? To which Warren replied, why don't you let me write something for you and take it to image, unless, how do you put it? Unless I have plans. What are my plans? Um, <laughs> <laughs> plans. Yeah, plans. I saw my plans. Um, so I, I reluctantly accepted uh, his offer. Uh, <laughs> when we were uh, talking about working together on Moon Knight, um, there was kind of a little back and forth. But was, uh, what I quite like about Warren is he's got a great kind of visual eye. Some writers don't really know how to write for comics. They might know how to write prose or, or whatnot. But uh, you need a good visual sense. And it makes, it makes working a writer like that very, very easy. Um, but uh, we were talking a lot about Wes Anderson movies. And something I noticed when I was watching Moonrise Kingdom was that there was a scene with the two kids, and in that scene the two children just walked closer, 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 and then they meet in the middle and start talking. And what I really liked about it was that, you know, a less confident director would have had to like would have felt the need to kind of zoom in or do some you know crazy shots like Gladiator hands through all the all the grass. I just I just liked the um, the the deliberate restraint which I think uh, when people are very insecure, they, they tend to just try to do something a bit more flashy. Um, it was something we talked an awful lot as well about the fact that everything is very centrally composed. There's a great supercut you'll find online of Wes Anderson movies, and it's all just like right in the middle, one, like kind of very Kubrickian, uh, 180 degree, right in the middle. Uh, all the shots were great. I was talking to Jordy as well. We were looking through, and uh, Jordy pointed out in this scene how the red blood matches the red on the, on the bandage. Uh, all the hair matches the. There's basically three colours in that shot. Yeah, like the red on the um, on the foam, the foam uh, can as well. Little things like that, which it's little attention to detail. Most people wouldn't even notice it, but it just creates more of a uh, a believable world. Same with this shot, where you have the uh, the towels are the same colour, uh, the the pink shoes, the pink telephone. All these little at, at, at the gloves as well on the bag. Once you start looking at this stuff, it's it's great. You forget there's actual art design departments in these films actually think about what they're doing. But uh, again, as we were working on these things, I, or we were talking, I, I, it was something I really wanted to try. It was a slightly more restrained way of uh, of telling stories. And as well, when you have these kind of like uh, letterbox panels, you can control how the reader goes through. So when you have a panel like this, you can read the first panel, and then the, the next panel you read right through. So we're, we, I wanted to kind of push that further on, uh, on injection. So there was just various backs and forth for, for a long time, like designing the uh, disarrange logo and uh, working on characters. Basically, my first pass on every character wasn't quite working, but I would talk to Warren and we would kind of flesh things out. Uh, so it was a kind of, that was kind of the most frustrating thing, working out the characters, because that's where you have to kind of really jump from. This uh, Robin Morrill, I was trying to draw a t sexy Tom Baker, but... <laughs> Apparently, those two things do not work together. Um, yeah, but um, and this is uh, Bridget, this is the Irish character. And it was a nice thing I asked for an Irish character in the book, and Warren gave me part of the story that basically takes place in, in Dublin each issue. Uh, it's a nice thing about doing a book that's, that you own. You can just do whatever you like, really. But um, yeah, essentially, it was, very, it was about building up this world. It's different to doing, say, a work for hire project where you basically just like mess around with a property. We, having the involvement of uh, Really, really building and making the look of a book and designing the book is it's, it's really, really rewarding. The, the previous slide, I'm sorry, actually, um, is uh, Phonographics, the designer on books like Saga. He's been excellent to work with. His just attention to design. If you look at all the, the different covers and the variants and whatnot, his attention to, to detail is, is fantastic. But um, yeah, this is all basically just behind the scenes stuff of trying to work. I just like, took old covers and tried to see how different brands would work with it. And it's, uh, you know, you don't make any money doing it, but it's really, really fun. <laughs> Um, and just trying to think about what you want to do for the trade design and stuff like that. It's stuff you just can't do when you're doing work for hire book, and it's incredibly satisfying. 
even something like uh, I had the idea of of having a barcode be the syringe in the back, which didn't quite work. We had to talk to uh, Phonographics a bit and try and make it work. But on the back of every issue, you can see that there's a capsule, much like the injection uh, uh, symbol. The barcode is within that. Just little things like that you just could never do at a, at a, at a, at a work for our company. Um, so this is the first image I did for the book in uh, Geordie's colors, which are phenomenal, of course. Um, it's just some you know, behind the curtain stuff, just I wanted to show like how I work with layouts and kind of edit story, trying to make it work. This is from the first issue, which uh, you all have now, so thank you. <laughs> but you can see the, the difference the color makes. It makes a big, big difference. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to show off some of the covers, basically. This is a cover for issue two, uh, the Big Bang variant, which you all have again. Thank you. This is the cover for issue three. Um, again, just color makes a huge difference. Actually, ma massive difference is there's a haunted very we're doing for each book. Uh, I spent ages drawing this, but uh, I just love what Jordy did with the colors. Just, it just completely changes the, the tone. <laughs> if there was a drawing there, I guess. But uh, that's something I want to push a little bit more is, is kind of do, we don't need to do covers to try to sell the book. We can just do stuff that's like an, an ex artistic experiment. So seeing if, I like the idea of you going into a comic book shop and not being able to see the cover and having to go and and look, because generally covers are like fighting for your attention. This one, deliberately not bothering to. Um, and uh, just as a treat, uh, I just want to show some uh, little snippets of uh, issue two, um, without giving too much story away. It's not a joke. <laughs> and uh, so I just recently finished issue three. Um, that's uh, just outside Pier Street, yeah. It's like getting into little things here and there. But um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to show a little bit of sneak peek before uh, Warren blows your minds. But um, uh, thanks everybody for coming and uh, picking up the book. And uh, yeah, hope you all enjoy it. Hello, Dublin. Hello. <laughs> Are we all sitting comfortably? <laughs> then I'll begin. I just got back. I just got back from Berlin, where I was talking about the future. After having just got back from Manchester, where I was talking about the future. Talking about the future is one of those things I do now. The future and the past the folklore of tomorrow. I come from a place on the Essex coast in England that once was all forest and colonized by the Vikings. The village I grew up in uh, was a Viking settlement. It's called Thundersley, derived from an older name meaning Thor's Clearing, which sounds pretty good until you discover that Dublin that was also a Viking colony, comes from an ancient term meaning dark pool, which is better than Thundersley, really. I kind of pissed off about that. I can't help but approach science and history from the standpoint of language. Because I'm a writer, sure, uh, but also because that's where those things truly live. Science can produce the, the greatest poetry of the age. Even headline writing, uh, otherwise sober institutions like, like fizz.org, take on mad poetry just because that's the way things are now. Actual headline. Multifractals suggest the existence of an unknown physical mechanism on the sun. An unknown physical mechanism on the sun. Just let that one sink in because that is some demented Lovecraftian genius. <laughs> Which may actually only be topped by this actual headline about the, uh, the New Star uh, NASA satellite. New Star captures 
possible screams from zombie stars. <laughs> this is the real music. Cosmology in ghost-free bi-gravity theory with twin matter fluids, the origin of dark matter. Actual headline. And a personal favorite, crystals may be possible in time as well as space. <laughs> Science is beautiful and mysterious and a source of constant wonder. It is our new wilderness landscape. It's, it's the new forest full of weird animals and spirits sliding in and out of view on the edge of the clearing and the pool. Now we have, and here's another headline, NASA funds electricity harvesting robotic space eel <laughs> with explosive jet thrusters and electroluminescent skin. <laughs> Once that sort of thing was, it was all folklore. These were the stories we told ourselves in order to try and understand the world around us. And we still do it today for the same reasons. Science and magic used to be a single field and they only split definitively around 350 years ago. Isaac Newton was an alchemist. Plato was a mathematician and a mystic who gave us the word daemon to describe the intercessionary spirits who, in his conception, guided our actions. A term that survives today as a computing process. It's no wonder we both come from drinking cultures. <laughs> Think about explosive, glowing robot space eels for a minute and you will probably need a drink. Even the Mighty Boosh episode about eels wasn't that weird. <laughs> this is where we live now. We live in the point where science fiction is actually written by science. Science fiction is broken. Science fiction fell in a ditch years ago. When, when the real world started getting weirder than writers could be, and faster, Writing near-future science fiction is a mugs game because any extrapolation we come up with on the current state of the world is outdone by a science news website five minutes later. Seriously, you, you pat yourself on the back for having thought of, I don't know, a clever 20 minutes into the future bit about drone technology, Open your web browser to have a quick look at the news and it's robot space eels and zombie stars all the way down. Science even got to the strange, chilly term gene editing before science fiction did. The term genetic engineering sounds archaic and stupid now. Even philosophy has been dragged into the dark pool by the madness of the science fiction condition we now live in. I remain oddly fascinated by a fantastically bleak enterprise generally referred to as speculative realism. It is the most, the most optimistic and forward-thinking strains of this particular movement in philosophy tell us that we live in a cold and uncaring cosmos where life means nothing and we are but a temporary infection smeared across an unremarkable rock hurtling through the blackness amid the radio howls of zombie stars. Furthermore, we have no more claim to existence or dreams than the rock itself, and the rock generally is of more use to the universe than we are. It's, that's the good news. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's, it's the philosophy of understanding the presence of things rather than people in some doomy Lovecraftian mode of looming leviathan forces we cannot possibly comprehend. They're happy books, and they have happy names. Eugene Thacker wrote the book In the Dust of This Planet, a title so snappy it immediately got appropriated and stuck on a clothing line. <laughs> Extinction aesthetic. <sighs> to me, it's, it's always the whole speculative realism thing has always had the sense of being on the verge of a connection with the in industrial economy, where humans are nothing but the reproductive organs of machines, massive machines that loom over us and haunt us. For now, they extend into the unseen digital planes of electromagnetic fields. It can almost tip over into a philosophical underpinning for accelerationism. The notion that capitalism should be unchained and allowed to run riot until it destroys itself. Let the wheels of industry crush everything until there's nothing left to crush but themselves. You can array any number of arguments against what is, as Benjamin Noyes said, basically a capitalism fetish. But the main one is that it still just doesn't really work like that. Not until we're all dead, and frankly, probably not even then. But speculative re realism says that our lives and deaths don't matter anyway. It's the systems of the world and the horrors of the universe that are the story. So there's the latest news from philosophy. The saviors of the human condition. Nothing actually matters, and building a future is pointless because time is a flat circle that is also a crystal. The robotic eel that will eat its own tail as mission control is subsumed in the dust of this planet. Accelerated world. The old wisdom, and by old I'm saying 20 years maybe, is that we were accelerating into a singularity. Everything getting faster and faster and weirder and weirder until there was some big bang and we emerged into new territory that we don't have maps for and everything will have changed. That's not how it's going to happen. Things will certainly continue to accelerate until we reach some awful terminal velocity, running riot without a wall at the far end of the track to crash into. I'm here to commemorate the launch of the comic series Injection, created with Declan Shelby and Geordie Belair. And this is what Injection is about. The science fiction condition the future at high speed, accelerating not towards a singularity where we exit into a perfect new world, but to an end endless gathering of speed until we live inside a continuum of hardcore weirdness. In the book, of course, this is a terrible exterminating thing that the characters must try to thwart before the earth becomes too weird to live on. And there are elements of magic and folklore in it that fictionalize this particular view of the science fiction condition. I like it. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to admit, I'm, I'm sure. I don't always recognize the things people point at and call dystopias as bad things. I was always terrified of J.G. Ballard's dictum that the future will be boring. I, I know what he was getting at. Marshall McLuhan said back in the 60s, when the world was still in the grip of all those authentic-seeming future narratives that turned out not to be real, we look at the present through a rear-view mirror. We march backwards into the future 
an environment becomes fully visible only when it's been superseded by the new environment. Thus, we are always one step behind in, have, in our view of the world. So from one perspective, everything seems kind of banal and chewed over and not good enough, and your phone's still crap. <laughs> when I rattle around Europe talking about the future, I like to try and refocus people's vision. We have fired a camera at Pluto that is traveling at 58,000 kilometers an hour this week. We can now see 13 billion years into the universe's past. There is now a 2D material that appears to decompose within a couple of days, but actually remains solid. It just becomes almost completely invisible. Researchers in Paris can stop and store light. A space drive is being tested that appears to break the laws of physics. The pH of a geyser plume on the moon of Enceladus has been identified. Dolphins have social networks. There are six people living in space today. And we have five space robots around Mars today. At least six new species have been discovered in the last few days. Artificial muscles have been constructed from gold-plated onion cells. This is all in the last week. <laughs> this is just the fun stuff. That is more serious, charged, important newness than that happened in entire years a millennium ago, perhaps even 10 years. In the last 10 years, we have discovered two previously unknown species of human. We can film eruptions on the surface of the sun, unknown mechanisms be damned. There are people printing prototypes of human organs and other people printing nanowire tissue that will bond with human flesh and the human electrical system. We have photographed the shadow of a single atom. We've got robot legs controlled by brain waves and satellites the size of coffee mugs that are controllable by mobile phone apps. This, this last week uh, in Trinity College, a self-healing bioluminescent gel was revealed with application in medicine, science, and technology. The future isn't happening in far-flung places. It's not happening everywhere else. It's happening everywhere, right here. You're part of it. It belongs to you too. This is where we live. This is our magic here in the science fiction condition. And we are damned good at it. And if sometimes we can only describe these things to each other as unknown physical mechanisms on the sun, then that's OK. If we're brought back to poetic license and the language of folklore to be able to talk about what's happening, then maybe that's only right and proper. We can be both scientists and alchemists if we want. It is perhaps a sign of common sense that we reach back into the past for language to decode the future for each other. If we tend towards the hyperbolic or even see story where there technically is, is none, then that's just how we're wired. The stone circles and the earthworks that litter these islands were put there to dramatize the landscape. They were specifically placed there to create stories out of the world around us in order to explain the world to ourselves. I'm standing inside a science gallery. It's a place you built to tell stories about the world to each other. Look at it. I mean, you saw the place when you were coming in. 
We used to build stone circles to explain the landscape, and now we build places like this. I once saw a presentation by the architect, Sir Peter Cook, where he showed a building that looked like a spaceship and said, look, it's landed. I can't decide if this place is a spaceship or a time crystal. The future is coming fast, and zombie stars are screaming at us across 13 billion years, and there are robot space eels waiting in the toilets for us. But these are not intrinsically bad things, apart from the eels. <laughs> kind of wish I hadn't thought of that line. They are what we make of them. We just need to keep telling the folklore, using the language, tell the stories. There's no such thing as future shock. It turns out that we're all much stronger than we ever gave ourselves credit for. We dealt with gods and monsters, so by God we can deal with the space eels. We adapt. Everything tells us that we should be overwhelmed by our accelerating future that's happening faster than we can prepare for. But Stuart Brand said, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. And he said that 47 years ago, the year that I was born. And we are monsters too, and we might as well admit that. We're pursuit predators who can heal almost any wound show up just before you think we just just when you think we've gone away and we'll attempt to have sex with pretty much anything in the universe <laughs> don't be afraid of the future we will never die we can do everything we ever want and we love stories more than anything stories are magic magic is science and science is what makes us human don't be bored and don't be afraid. Have a drink. Sit around the pool in the clearing. The future is coming. And we're going to win. Thanks for your time. Thank you.